Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious as I am in lunacy, as you see here, this crater behind me. That is Jack Schmidt up there by the lunar rover on Apollo 17, landed just about an hour ago. It's 51 years ago today in space history. It's 4 o'clock on December 11th, 2023, Eastern Standard Time in Titusville, Florida, inside our wonderful museum that for 22 years has been preserving the birth of America's space age, and this is one of its high points. The Apollo 17 landing, the ultimate Apollo mission on the moon, and nobody has gone back in 51 years. Nobody, okay? And that is pretty amazing to think about, particularly the baby boomers like me that thought we would have Antarctica-style bases with 30 or 40 people in shifts like we're doing on the International Space Station every six months. But maybe we'll get to that. Uh, but it's going to be at least 2027 for Artemis, so says the U.S. government accounting office. Forget about that 2024 stuff they're all talking about. And are we really going back to the moon? Well, we'll find out. My good friend Marty Winkle, my co-producer here, hope you live long enough. My dear friend, he's a, a senior citizen, a little older than me, and worked on the Apollo G uh, Grumman Lunar Module, and Marty, uh, good to see you here on the last lunar landing uh, 51 years ago. Your life was about to change, and anytime you want to talk about anything, please chime in on our UCAC family microphone there, Marty. Okay. All right, he says. Good. Uh, but uh, so what we have here is we're at the edge of the... Uh, 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 crater that they went up next to was one of these big craters. Thank you, Marty. And people don't think that the moon has color to it, but look at these colors here. You see a lot of oranges. This is where they found the orange soil uh, on one of the lunar walk walks that you hear repeated all the time as Schmidt finds the only geologist to go to the moon is telling Gene Cernan, his commander, that, you know, orange soil, orange soil. We'll see a close-up of that. And what's happened here is little fissures of lava was spewing out of those those vents here where this orange is above my head inside that crater. And uh, just a, a, amazing textures and colors going on here that you really don't think about looking up at the old gray moon in the sky that's orbiting the Earth. But uh, astronauts always mention there is a lot of color uh, reds and, and greens and just whatever you find in deserts uh, in uh, types of rock formations. So let me have a little drink here and we're going to get kicked off here. It's holiday uh, time. We want to fill you all with holiday spirit. There's Santa Claus getting ready for the big trip around the world two weeks from today at some alien lounge. We're uh, not sure who the artist is on that. But he's a good one. We're also going to feature this week in, on our Facebook next week the uh, artwork of uh, Don McKay, who is a NASA artist uh, that uh, drew some classical Christmas cards like this one, Merry Christmas from the Spaceport. Did this in the 1960s. So. Well, we're going to talk about Apollo 17, the last humans on the moon in 1972. And orbiting the moon was Stu Rosa. He passed away uh, uh, about 20 years after this mission. Again, Gene Cernan died about five years ago. Gene was very active promoting the uh, space program as well as returning to the moon. And then Jack Schmidt, who is uh, 88 years old, and he is the second youngest person to go to the moon, the uh, born in July. Uh, Charlie Duke is the youngest, and he is 88 years old. Uh, I think he was born in uh, September, October, somewhere in there after Schmidt. And it's just sad to think about. Uh, Jack Schmidt is only one of four moonwalkers of 12 left living that can talk about that experience at age 88. Think about that. Then you got Charlie Duke. You got 90 two-year-old Buzz Aldrin of Apollo 11, and David Scott of Apollo 15. 
And that's it. And uh, soon they'll be gone. I had the privilege of talking to Jack Schmidt uh, up in East Upper East Tennessee, where I was a uh, uh, I covered him for a uh, event that he was at for three days, and uh, I'll tell you some personal comments that he made to me uh, talking in front of a University of Tennessee group of uh, people where he always went every year because he was a geologist and he he taught a class there for a couple weeks every year. Marty, did you have a question? No, but uh, somebody by, I'll say the initials B-A-A, -A, he's asking, when, if ever, do you think we will get men up there again, meaning the moon? Well, I actually think it'll probably be in the 2030s. All right. Artemis is a very complex mission. Uh, I'm going to take that back. If we go there before 2030s, it's not going to be NASA being there. It's going to be either Chinese or Elon Musk is going to go on his own uh, with a bunch of people. Uh, and that's a real reality. Okay, we know how Mr. Musk works. He crashed about 18 of his Falcon 9s before they... Uh, had the first one finally stuck. Uh, so uh, we're excited to watch a Falcon Heavy tonight uh, taking up a top secret mini space plane. And two of those boosters are going to come back on that Falcon Heavy tonight. So he's mastered that. And it took him quite a while to do it. Uh, but billionaires can spend a lot of money that uh, the government can't and wasting things. And he's getting paid back triple. You better believe it. So uh, but Marty, I think you're tuned into what people are saying and so forth around here in the Space Coast. It This Artemis mission is very complicated, made more complex by the refueling that's going to have to happen to the Starship uh, before it goes off to the, the moon and then coming back from the moon. And uh, and there's just a lot of things that, that uh, are in the way. So... Uh, like to see it in 2027, but uh, I, I expect the whole Artemis program uh, could be changed just like that in Washington by the next administration, whoever it is. It happens all the time, whether it's a Democrat or Republican or whatever. They always have aspirations to go to the moon and then or Mars, uh, but going to Mars, Mars is, we'll be lucky to get to Mars this century, and I'm serious about that. What do you think, Marty? Got any opinions on that? Um, let me think about that, but we have another question from BAA. Is the government not funding SpaceX or NASA? Is what? Is the government, I guess I'll rephrase what he wrote. Is uh, the government funding SpaceX? Absolutely the government's funding SpaceX. That's where they got to where they're all. This is an agreement between the private companies and NASA spending government money as seed money to help them uh, get get uh, build the job structure they need to build and get the, the data they need to build. So this has been no secret. SpaceX has got plenty of money from the government. Uh, Blue Origin has gotten seed money. You say, why do billionaires need this money? Well, they need it to, to show that, uh, that the country's in good faith because We've got the government's got all the launch pads over here. It's and uh, if you build your own, like at Boca Chica, Texas, you're you get you're going to have a lot of have to deal with a lot of infrastructure like ecology and city governments and so forth. But uh, this is the way NASA wants to work: is helping startup companies uh, figure out ways to uh, push the envelope in space. So. Appreciate your comments and questions. We can't maybe get to all of them because we want to get through our program today. And uh, again, I'm mesmerized by this green screen that Marty took. This The colors are so rich there. Well, here's the emblem for Apollo 17. Uh, it uh, basically characterizes man's exploration will continue. You've got the, the uh, emblem of America, the stars and stripes, red, white, and blue all throughout this thing. Uh, that is Apollo. The Roman God is who's shown there uh, as a fitting end to this program. And you've got Saturn and a galaxy there showing that we shall continue to explore uh, beyond the moon uh, and Mars on this. Uh, there are the astronauts. If you don't know them by heart, seated there is Gene uh, Cernan, 38 years old. He flew a... This would be his third mission to space. He flew with uh, uh, Tom Stafford on the 
a board of well, Gemini nine, where he had a very harrowing experience of spacewalking. Uh, and then uh, he went to the moon with again, Tom Stafford in Apollo 10, Snoopy, that's still orbiting the sun, by the way, the upper stage of the lunar module Snoopy. I guess that'd be LM number four, Marty, because uh, after 11 was LM five. That is Harrison Schmidt on the left. He became a, a senator uh, after uh, his, uh, he worked for NASA. He was the only geologist to go to the moon. Okay. Uh, he uh, actually bumped, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to think of the astronaut he bumped. Uh, always have trouble with the X-15 pilot and uh, was commander of a shuttle. I see his face. And then there's Ron Evans, Ron a uh, distinguished, uh, balded gentleman there. And I think he died of cancer uh, way too young. Gene lived it to, into his 80s. And who was bumped from Apollo 17 and then was promised to be a commander of Apollo 19 or 20 was Joe Engel, Marty. Joe Engel, who's who's uh, also 90 years old. Thanks for working on that for me there, Marty. But I knew this senior gray head would kick in. Of course, this is the trip they had to make. Artemis is looking at the same way, except it's going to have a gateway space station orbiting between the Earth and the moon. Uh, I think that's going to be, I don't know if you, you know, can, if you're only going to have an Artemis launch once a year, you know, what's, what's the purpose of the gateway? You can't keep people up there for a year. You have to keep swapping them out. But we'll see as they get this thing ramped up. There is a wonderful picture of the launch uh, taken by uh, uh, Steve Nolte took that picture and uh, Tom Musiak was standing beside him taking another picture. We talk about Tommy's work a lot. Uh, Steve Nolte, big shout out to you. The night launch, the only night launch in the Apollo program. I was Saturn V. This is what the permanent firing room pass would have looked like had you had it. And if you see these occasionally on uh, our auctions or other places. This is probably worth a couple hundred dollars easily. Uh, whoever was the 511 there that had that pass in the firing room, something like that would go easily for uh, a couple hundred dollars. And yo ho ho, there is Mr. Gene Cernan driving around in the uh, test rover and Boy, wouldn't you like to have been the, on the tour from Omaha, Nebraska on that day and seen Gene Cernan waving at you while he was training to do the lunar rover, the big deal. Third time they took wheels on the moon, uh, electric car. Of course, it worked beautifully on the surface of the moon, except they had a fender fall off. And we'll show you a fix on that fender. Well, let's give you a little bit of lunar geology here. Why did we go to where we went? Well, as you see, Apollo 11, 12, 14, and 16, for that matter, are all in the equator of the moon. Didn't take a lot of extra fuel or, or guidance type of issues, guidance and navigation issues, to go when you're orbiting around the equator. But Apollo 15 went up in a mountainous area, as you see, and so did Apollo 17. Apollo 16 chose a mountainous area that just happened to be near the equator. But they're not going too far away from the center of the moon. And we're going with Artemis at the very bottom of the moon, which is going to have to have a orbit that goes from pole to pole, not around the, 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 uh, the equator of the moon. Now, circled there in red are big impact areas where asteroids hit the moon in its infancy and carved out these these huge craters that later got filled with lunar uh, lava, which was the consistency of a lightweight motor oil. Not, or it's very lightweight, not like molasses or, or, or syrup or heavier oil, more just like a light uh, oil, almost maybe like you'd use uh, uh, automatic transmission fluid because the moon gravity is one sixth and then all of this bubbled up. When did this happen? Well, we think about the moon is almost 5 billion years old. The oldest rocks brought back from the moon are about 4.5 billion years old. Uh, much older than anything on Earth because all those earthly rocks have been 
uh, uh, erosion has moved them around. So these impacts in Imbrium and Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity there, uh, happened uh, shortly after the moon started to cool. There was a lot of big bodies in the solar system. As you look around, look at the cratered surface of the moon. It looks like Mercury uh, that doesn't have an atmosphere, just a shooting gallery of, of things plowing into it. But this all stopped about 3 billion years ago. And then the, 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 the lava bubbled up and really filled up where Apollo 17 landed, that Mare Serenity, we actually landed in a little inlet, so to speak, uh, there, and we'll show you that in a minute. Mare Chrysium on the right there is an oval sea, Sea of Crisis, Luna 24, 20, and 16 by Russia was put there because that was an easy trajectory for them from what, where they launched in Kazakhstan. So uh, we're going to need a lot of extra fuel and energy to go to the South Pole because there's, we think, in craters that don't get sunlight is water ice from comets. Here is a close-up look at where the landing point is, where you see the little arrow there in the middle. The North and South Massif were actually mountain ranges that they had to climb over and, and then drop down among them. How thrilling would that be if, like, you were have ever been in a the Alps or anywhere like that, where you're going in a gondola down in between the mountains. That's what Apollo 17 did. I wanted to point out that the mountains on the moon, when Mare Serenitatis was formed, it pushed things up. The mountains of the moon, technically, a lot of people say they're not mountains. They are impact debris from asteroids that hit the moon. And that is very true in a, in a, in a sense. Uh, where all these mountains were pushed and some of it was just ejected away. And you can see where Mare Imbrium impacts could land at the bottom here, over here, easily. You could have debris landing here that happened way up at the top when these impacts happened, scattered debris all over the globe. So what you're looking at here is where clumps, nothing got pushed up here. Things got thrown there in big clumps. And then the lava welled up millions of years later. And this lava where the lunar module uh, Challenger landed uh, is a mile thick, they think, very deep there. So these mountains were quite high. Actually, clumps of debris that landed there were, are, were quite high, and they're still quite high, but filled up uh, much, almost a mile by the lava that impacted it. Then other meteors hit it. In sporadic, this looks like a like a shower of meteors that peppered it there. Now, now this is a geographical map of the area, and in the center, the yellow you see are the craters that we see here in the middle. All right, and this is just to emphasize the brown is a different type of. Those are the mountains that clumped were ejected from uh, Mare Imbrium, uh, 500 miles away. Uh, the 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 gray are different textures. You've got the, the dark blue, the purple, the green. All these are different minerals or different textures or different ages associated with what's going on here. So, and what happened here in the yellow? That yellow is, is a debris that fell in a landslide off of this massif, exposing things that are inside that massif. So this was a very rich geological area to see a, a half a dozen different type of scenarios that happened on the moon and try to put it all together. And here's a view from a lunar orbiter that scouted this out. The landing areas, those little craters in the foreground there. Uh, some One was called Camelot. They called the other ones the, uh, the triplets. Uh, they just named these things as they got closer to so that everyone could talk about them on Earth. And there's that big landslide you see uh, from the lunar massif. That's the yellow there off that brown in the center of the photo. And the, and, uh, the light yellow and the dark yellow is all the, the uh, craters there. So quite a stunning scene. And then our lunar reconnaissance orbiter years later has photographed the traces of what's left the descent stage of Challenger. Uh, you can see the footprints even where the astronauts, where they went. It's like in the snow, 
fluffy, but it was darker underneath the lunar soil or regolith. And there's where the uh, tracks of the rover are and other things they set up. Now, I have just gone crazy, as you all know, about the Project Apollo Archive on Flickr. And this is the screen grab of that first page of, of Flickr, where there's 15,836 photos, okay, that I've been looking at since I joined in 2015, I see up there in the top, all right. They have it labeled mostly by the magazines of film that was taken. Now, these in the beginning are selected pictures, okay? But uh, every photo taken on the surface of the moon, orbiting the moon, and other things can be found in this project archive on Flickr, just as if the, 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 the uh, 70 millimeter rolls of Hasselblad were in front of you and you were looking at them, film sprockets and all are scanned. And also at the beginning, they would shoot, actually at the end of every film roll, they would put the uh, a, a, a slate, all right, we would call it, with the colors and details on there so that you could, on the film, see how the emulsion has uh, changed during development so you can get accurate colors on everything on there. So I love seeing that. And when the, the last picture on the frame is taken, sometimes it's been flashed, exposed as they were loading it, like this last frame of a famous picture that you've all seen. The one before it was the good one that you've seen a lot. And uh, so that would be, uh, on that side, that would be uh, Harrison Schmidt jumping into the lawn chair of the lunar rover there. And uh, you can see he's got some blinder things on there. Now here I want to show you, here's a picture that's on the the, the Flickr. You, you see every picture as they're taken and nothing is corrected. You even see the Risso lines. That's what the X's are. Those are called Risso lines to help gauge distances and ratios uh, with a little bit of geometry and trigonometry. But you can do anything you want to these photos. In fact, this is how the photos presented on Flickr. And I spent about 15 minutes changing it to look like this from that to that all right look at this wow we humans are throwing our trash all over the moon there in the foreground on the bottom is the rectangular personal life support system of one of the astronauts that threw out the uh the door of the uh lamb uh the right i guess that'd be right in front of where the the ladder is because they'd have to throw it out that door uh, to for to save weight. Now they did keep their lunar boots, I think, on this mission, uh, and may have brought back the helmets even. But this is the way the picture looks, and you you got like, oh, that's not very interesting. Uh, wait a minute. So every picture on there can be enhanced. Look at the tracks, and way up at the top of the picture, Marty, is the lunar rover where it was parked about a thousand feet away to take the lift off on the Lunar Rover camera there. So glad to share that with you one more time to amaze you with my photo, uh, Photoshop skills there. Isn't that cool though? You also find a lot of pictures are cropped like the famous Buzz Aldrin visor shot. Uh, they've cropped out about one third of the frame on that. Uh, there is, uh, in fact, I looked that up. You can see the red stripes on it. So that's Gino. The commander had red stripes on his helmet, his arms, and his thighs. There is the rover, quite a distance away and quite high, too. So the astronauts would drive away from each other a little bit. And all of this was on beautiful color live television in 1972. But guess what we didn't have in 1972? Uh cable TV, 24-hour news service. Hardly anybody watched this. They would interrupt uh, during certain times when uh, an event was going on, uh, when they were getting out of the LEM or getting back into it on the three EVAs. Uh, mostly showed it to preempt soap operas during the day. Uh, just sad coverage. Look at this. Uh, three miles away with a telephoto lens. There's your ride home. All right. Whew. That'd make me a little nervous. They did drive five miles away from the lunar rover. Lost, I mean, the, the lunar rover drove five miles away from the LEM, LEM 14, called um, 
Challenger. Here's a picture of the uh, heat flow experiment that Apollo 16 didn't work out because John Young tripped over it. And, uh, pardon me? Lem 12. Lem 12. I said 14, didn't I? Yeah, Lem 12, not 14. Uh, if there was a 14, Marty, that would have been uh, uh, 19s, I guess. These beautiful panoramas. There's one that uh, I'm not sure that is 17. I tell Marty, no mountains in the background, but maybe it's from a different angle, but still gives you the whole idea of the layout. And there, Harrison Schmidt's got his his visor up there. Moonwalker Jack Schmidt, when I saw him in uh, 2011 at the University of Tennessee, said that uh, NASA's new Constellation manned space program quote, just gets us where we were 40 years ago. So I'm sure he's thinking the same thing about Artemis because he said, we let it all go. Uh, we did not advertise our investment we put into Apollo. We walked away, and I believe history will judge us harshly, said Jack Schmidt. Uh, he grew up in Santa Rosa, New Mexico. Uh, he said, we've not had a coherent space policy since Apollo. Uh, with the with the shuttle, we lost our deep space capabilities. Now we're trying to regain that back with Artemis there, as we look at this interesting close up view of uh, uh, this. Somebody I love these artistic shots, and you see so very few of them. Uh, Schmidt said that. Um, uh, oh, he said it was. Um, he's very disappointed. Because in his opinion, America blew it by not continuing manned exploration of deep space in the 1970s. And he said uh, America's apathy uh, toward NASA's incredible achievements echo that. Um, he, he, uh, he became a senator from New Mexico for a six-year term. As we look at a shelf of a rock. This is just a big rock formation there. And in the background is the distance. And you can see where someone in the upper left took a swipe sample out of that lunar dust lay in there. Where'd that come from? Where did those rocks come from that landed there? Were they thrown there from the Imbrium impact uh, uh, 500 miles away? And that's what they were there to figure out. Uh, Schmidt said that... Uh, during the world tour that the Apollo 17 crew took, he said it was remarkable to see the turnout. We as a nation did not capitalize on that, and we're paying the price. And uh, he feels that uh, that is the big legacy of Apollo, is that we didn't continue on, and that after 17, we should have continued with the program. We should have built bases. He wrote a book, Return to the Moon, Exploration, Enterprise, and Energy, in the human settlement for space um, and jack schmidt basically his book's pretty boring it's all scientific he's not a warm fuzzy guy about the looking at the blue marble made me feel like this he was a geologist and he did a lot of great geology on the moon and there is oxygen three on the moon is very um uh resourceful and you can do a lot of things with it also the astronauts collected 244 pounds of rock and uh, the Fender came off on their rover during, I think, their third EVA. And uh, so they took uh, some of the the uh, notes. Uh, or I guess it was the second EVA because they made this up and knew they were going to fix it. And what is the recognizable adhesive on that Fender, Marty? Yes, sir. Duct tape. Yep. Duct tape bear. Duct tape can survive 200 above... Uh, uh, in, in the heat of the day, it wasn't that hot when they were there because they were there in more the morning light. But uh, there's uh, Schmidt sitting in the uh, right-hand seat. Uh, the commanders always drove the rover. They never let the, uh, the other guy drive uh, for some reason. And that's not because I've looked at this in very detail. Each seat is about the same. They're a lawn chair. I've looked at it in detail at the uh, Kennedy Space Center there, the Saturn V Center, the rep, well, the actual one they use there. But um, uh, it was just one of those things, I guess. So I think, uh, uh, I think Marty, somebody in a crowd asked Charlie Duke that when you had him here with your grummy 
Grumman Group. And he said, nope, he never did get to drive it. So, well, great. Jack Schmidt, by the way, six years in Congress, he said, my footprints will last on the lunar surface for one or two million years. But those I left in Washington are another story. <laughs> so, look at this gorgeous picture. The colors, when you see it up close, are very rich. Go to the Apollo archives of Flickr and enhance these pictures yourself. Really, they're they're quite amazing. Here's just one of the close-ups. You don't think about the moon having this breccia, they call it, breccia, B-R-E-C-C-I-A. This is where lots of different materials came together in one rock as it was molten and flung up into the air and other other debris flying in the air hit it. And when it come down like this crystallized, you see, you see yellow, you see uh, browns and whites and so forth in this rock, veins of it in there. How did this all happen? A geologist can tell us. And there's the orange soil that you, you one of the most played back of all the moonwalks is, uh, you know, when you hear, hey, this soil is so orange soil, says uh, Schmidt and, and Sir Stern says, wait till I get there to look at it. Wait till I get there. Of course, he's talking to a geologist. Is pretty sure what he's seeing there. And, and uh, yep, it's oil. And then look at the, the gnomon they call it in the upper left there with the red on the chart so they can gauge the colors of things there. This was caused by a, uh, not caused by rust, but it's a process of lava spurting out like a geyser. All right. And it actually spurted out there's glass beads all over, microscopic glass beads all over the lunar soil because of this process. Well, there's America, LM12, <clears throat> from a couple miles away at the telephoto lens. Another beautiful rendition of it there. American flag flying proudly there. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit of an angle there, but nothing like Apollo 15 was almost in a crater there. And then once again, they landed in an area that was solid lava lake, maybe a mile thick, that over millions of years, the lunar dust and micrometeorites hitting it uh, have, have fluffed up this regolith. What's a micrometeorite, Marty, you ask? Mo a dust moat is, is a micrometeorite. Things that small, uh, pelting at 30,000 miles an hour fluff things up over millions of years. And here is where the final parking spot for the lunar rover. It would look just like that if uh, one of them SpaceX rockets would land nearby and they'd go up in their rover and check it out. Probably put some batteries in it and drive it over to the lunar module over there. But you're only going to see half of that lunar module there in the background as it popped off in live TV, just like Apollo 15 and 16 did uh, on, uh, I guess that'd be December uh, 14th is when they left the moon. Uh, I always, boy, watching that was a big thrill, Marty. And uh, Marty, my co-producer here, had a lot to do with that as uh, that was your job, right, Marty? And uh, uh, comment a little bit about how many pyrotechnics had to go off there, if you would, sir. Oh gosh, I'm not sure. I know just just on the four connecting points, it was uh, two at each. So that's eight. The guillotine was two. So that's ten. Then you had some tanks, uh, you no know, for fuel. Uh, so I I would guess we probably had about uh, about sixteen, eighteen. Wow, instantaneous, instantaneous too, <laughs> and. Uh... Uh, Marty, why don't you, uh, would you please share with me your, uh, the bad dream you had about this? It's funny because I'm not the only one who had this dream. Uh, yeah, I, my, my dream was that one of the bolts did not fire on separation when we're lifting off the moon, and that caused the Aston stage to tip over and crash back into the moon. And other people, other friends of mine, at similar type dreams. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, dreams of over fifty years ago. Yeah, cables and, and 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 pipes and stuff that are involved there had to be cut. If that had not, it just drug it right back down and smacked it into the moon. And if the astronauts had survived, they probably wish they hadn't. So, uh, 
And here's the lunar module. America, look at that descent stage that worked beautifully on the back end of it there. The last look at, at the last time humans were in a spaceship made only for them. I think I can see the uh, commander, uh, Cernan's helmet in that window, Marty. Yeah. Is that, uh, I think I see the edge of Cernan's, uh, well, that is one of the greatest shots of, of, of uh, the lunar module there. And of course, they docked up at the top. There's the door that they came out of. All right. Just incredible to think about 50 years ago. And then there's America with uh, Ron Evans in it. Happy to see them. And he would do a spacewalk to go out and get the film out of uh, the open uh, sim bay. They called it science instrument uh, bay. So uh, here is on the moon, AS. Paul 17, uh, and the, the, the descent stage right there taken by the lunar orbiter, which is this, what we look at now from space up there. And we go up there, someday it'll be a tourist attraction for uh, uh, our grandchildren's grandchildren, maybe. It'll be a museum. Yeah, it'll be a museum. Yes, it'll be a museum. The American Space Museum at Apollo 17 site in and Taurus Litro. Tom Usiak, thank you for watching today, buddy. Hope you're having a good holiday. Dave Stangy has got four more days to work, Marty. They're countdowning his uh, retirement. They want to get him out of there as fast as they can, I guess. But uh, he's uh, had a great career, apparently, and uh, is uh, uh, four more days to, till retirement, Dave, and you deserve it. And you'll probably find, like Marty and I, you're busier than you ever were when you retire. Cliff Watson, my friend in Pomona, Australia. What kind of brekkie are you having this morning? Scramble mind eggs for me, please. Mark Usiak's watching. Hey, Mark, good to see you. Larry Pushkar, another Michigander. Uh, we got uh, I, 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 Nut. all right? Thank you for your questions there, I, O, Nut. Cynthia Rossi, hope you're staying warm. I assume she's in Texas. Bill Whiting's up in Michigan. Robert Law. Faithful Watcher up in Dundee, Scotland. We got uh, Bar BAA watching. Doug Forrest is up there in uh, Los Angeles. Gonna Yeah, I got a little shout out to you here, Doug. Hold on a second. Uh, Gary Gerald's up there in uh, Collins, Georgia. Tom Celentano in Hartford, Connecticut. And Carlton Bailey is in Cape Canaveral Groves, Florida, about 12 miles from where I'm speaking to you right now. Hope you're doing well, CB. He's getting ready for that Falcon Heavy launch tonight at 8, about 8.15, 8.13, something like that. So, well, let's get us out of here, Marty, by talking a little bit about some more Friends of the Museum. This is a, a, a picture of uh, Gene Cernan on the moon. Or is it? Wait a minute. Is that a painting of Gene Cernan on the moon? Or is that a picture of Gene Cernan on the moon? Which is which, Marty? Well, that's the photograph. And this is Mr. Chris Callie's gorgeous rendition of the last man on the moon, Gene Cernan. 51 years ago right now, we're living that drama. I forgot to mention, go to Apollo 17 Live. And you can see what's happening right now on the landing and the moonwalks for the next three days. Apollo 17 Live. I'll promote that later in the week, I guess. Uh, there is another Chris Kelly tribute to Apollo 17, The Last Footprints on the Moon. A pencil sketch there, drawing that he did. And there is Ron Woods. Ronnie, a great artist, also a suit room technician. That's his rendition of a famous picture of Gene Cernan and the American flag. And there you go, Doug Forrest, Forrest with two R's. That is Doug's uh, tribute to Apollo, The Last Step. And though I think he made that for Apollo 11, it certainly is apropos for Apollo 17 as they're taking the last step. Something that Marty could never do. Though you're looking at that ladder, Marty knew not to get on it because he would be too heavy and break it because it was made for 1-6 gravity. Right, Marty? You're right. He says, I'm right. 
And we go out with this beautiful montage from our good friend Chris Kelly, a montage celebrating Apollo 17 and Gene Cernan there and all things artists perceive out of their brains to put on canvas for, and this collage a montage. So beautiful, beautiful job there, Chris Kelly. And we hope everybody, again, gets in the festive spirit, gets on the naughty, gets off the naughty list before Santa comes a-knocking here in two weeks. So thank you, everybody, for watching Stay Curious today. Marty, we have anything to button up on our Streamlabs production there? No, nope, we're good to go. Ah, and I'm good to go with a slug of rocket fuel there. Well, again, <clears throat> we hope that you all enjoy a wonderful holiday. We're going to have uh, Terry White will be our guest tomorrow. He's going to talk about uh, reprocessing Columbia for the first time in the STS-2 launch, among some other things. And then we've got uh, Perry, a uh, woman named Perry Horner. Horner. Perry Horner will be here. She is a configuration management person, a uh, very detailed job that basically says, I'm in charge of every part that every engineer wants, and uh, you got to come to me to get them. So we'll see about Perry uh, tomorrow. Looking forward to uh, uh, talking to her Wednesday, and we'll promote her tomorrow a little bit more. And then uh, Thursday and Friday, we'll get into a little bit of the space history. Uh, and uh, uh, hope you all enjoy that as we get into the, the two weeks before Christmas. So. Thank you, Marty, for a good Streamlabs job today. Hope that you all think about Apollo 17 51 years ago. You're going to have to get up early to see the moon. The moon's in the after midnight sky. Okay, going to new phase. So uh, it's not going to be up there to remind you like, like it is so many times. But only six human landings of this moon. I'm looking at it behind me on this green screen. 51 years has not happened. It's not going to happen for another, apparently at least, four more years, according to the government accounting office and this number crunching of Artemis. So uh, we're going to go a long time before we see another scene like this. So go and check out these pictures on Flickr and play with them like yourself and have a good time thinking about our moon man. Well, until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us. <laughs>